Okay, we are making a vocabulary diamond, and this is for one of my favorite stories in our reading book. Um, it's just an outstanding story, and part of the reason why I really like it is because it's a true story, and it's about a person who lived in Watsonville. I'm going to zoom out really quickly, and... I'm going to make, go ahead and make my, I folded my paper into four squares off camera. I'm making my four squares and then I'm putting in my X. And I noticed that a lot of you are not using a ruler when you put your X in. So it looks a little bit sloppy on your papers. So I recommend using a ruler because it's faster and it's neater. And neatness is always a good thing. It always makes it easier to read your paper and to study from. Um, if we go back to, if we get back to being in class, we have a game that we play using these papers and so you want them to be neat. It's a speed game where you're trying to find an answer. And so you want your paper to be really neat so that you can play the game quickly. All right, I'm going to do the back side as well. And I'm putting X's in each box. So anyhow, this story is, it's an interesting story. It is, technically it's historical fiction. And it was written by the same author who wrote Becoming Naomi Leon. And also it's the same author who wrote Esperanza Rising, which is going to be our next big story that we read together. So, um, Writing Freedom is about a real person. Um, not a lot of details are known about her life. And so this person was a stagecoach driver. She was the first and only female stagecoach driver that we know of um, in United States history. Or, or there might have been a couple of other, other ones, but she's the only one in California. And one of the things, if you lived in the 1700s or 1800s, women weren't really allowed to have the same jobs that men had. And so um, that was frustrating for women. So um, in this case, uh, this woman decided that she was going to disguise herself as a man so that she could get the job that she wanted. She liked working with horses. She wanted to be a stagecoach driver. It was not a job that women were allowed to do. So she dressed up like a man and pretended to be a man. And she was able to get the job that she wanted. And no one knew that she was a woman. Um, there is a similar person that you'll learn about in fifth grade. I hope you learn about her. Her name was Deborah Sampson. And she was an indentured servant. And... An indentured servant was somebody who wanted to come to the United States but didn't have any money. And so they signed an agreement or an indenture saying that they would come to the United States and they would work for seven years until they earned their freedom. And then after seven years, they could be free <laughs> after they were done working really hard. It was not the same thing as slavery because there was freedom at the end of that of their seven-year time period. However, Deborah Sampson felt like she was a slave. And one day she was sitting in church on her day off 
She was sitting in church and she heard them read the Declaration of Independence out loud. And she said to herself, I'm all for that. I'm for freedom. And so she decided to join the Revolutionary Army. Women were not allowed in the army back then. That was definitely not a job that women did. So Deborah Sampson cut off all of her hair. And actually, since it was the 1700s, she probably didn't have to cut off very much because men wore ponytails. Um, so she trimmed her hair <laughs> so that she could have a short, neat ponytail that looked like a, a man. And then she joined the Revolutionary Army. And she fought for the revolutionary uh, revolutionary side. And she was really good at camouflaging the fact that she was a woman. Unfortunately, she was shot during the fighting. And the bullet was lodged in her leg. And she kept telling them, I'll be fine. It's not a big deal. Because she didn't want them to take her to a doctor. Because she knew that the doctor would have to take her pants off in order to take the bullet out. And she knew that the doctor would then find out that she was not a man, that she was a woman and that she was, she had signed up to be a soldier and she was afraid that they would kill her for that. And so she ended up going to the doctor. The doctor found out that she was a woman and she was going to be court-martialed, I believe, from the army. But so many people that she fought with agreed that she was so brave that they ended up supporting her. All of her fellow soldiers supported her. And um, she was not court-martialed. She ended up leaving the army and got married and had kids. <laughs> I just think it's so awesome if Deborah Sampson was your mom and she'd had this life in disguise um, and this life of adventure as a soldier. And then it turned out that that was really just your mom. I think that's so cool. So she um, is from the 1700s. And the character in the story that we're reading about, um, we're going to be reading about this week, is in the 1800s. Um, her name was Charlotte Parkhurst. And she changed her name to Charlie when she became a stagecoach driver. Um, I'm going to go ahead and write my name in the corner. And I'm going to start out by writing our first word, which is satisfied. Um, satisfied means feeling gratified. It's an adjective. And it also can be a verb. And it means feeling gratified or pleased. Our synonym is contented. And... So if you're satisfied, you feel pretty good about something or you feel pleased. And so if you're successful at something, like if you're really good at doing something, um, you feel very contented. So if you come in first place at something that you're, you're happy that you're good at, you might feel pretty contented and pretty happy right that you won your won the first place ribbon give myself bigger hair and we'll make it like a hair ribbon <laughs> that i won first place all right okay the next word is pioneer Um, pioneer is a noun and my synonym that I got was initial. So a pioneer is like the first, 
person to settle a region. So it's the initial person that starts out living in a region. Um, So Charlotte Parkhurst, because she disguised herself as a man and became a stagecoach driver, um, the tricky part about Charlotte is that no one ever knew that until after she died because she was really good at her disguise was really good and she just lived as a man. She was happier living that way and also she didn't want anyone to find out. So... Um, but she was one of the first people not to settle a region, but one of the first um, women definitely to do a job that, sh that she wanted to do and to become a stagecoach driver. So a pioneer can also be the first person to do something um, that no one else has really done before. So you could say that um, the three men that landed on the moon were pioneers because they were the first people to to arrive on the moon. So I'm going to draw a little picture of the moon. <laughs> the moon has craters on it. And they put a flag on the moon, which is still there. Um, the cool thing about the moon is that nothing changes. There's no wind, there's no water, there's no erosion. So the people who landed there <laughs> left their footprints behind and also the flag. All right, um, next word is frontier. Frontier is a noun. So a frontier is the part of a country that borders another country. So California, and I put on here borderline. So California was actually part of Mexico. And I believe, I'm not really sure exactly if Charlotte was before or after. I think she might have been after the gold rush. We'll have to look and see in the story. So California was a part of Mexico, and Mexico was huge. It was ginormous. So Mexico included all of this territory up here. So Arizona, New Mexico, California, these were all a part of Mexico. And there was a war, the Mexican-American War, and when the war was over, California became its own state, right? So in this story, we're talking about um, California was kind of the frontier um, because it was part of, it had been part of Mexico and they established a new border after the, um, after the war, the Mexican-American War. All right, our next word is expansion. And expansion is a word that gets used a lot in history. It is a noun because the United States went from being 13 colonies to expanding and people felt that it was our manifest destiny to go all the way from one ocean to the other ocean and to have it be one big, huge country. And so that's part of the reason that we fought the Mexican-American War because we wanted all this territory to be part of the United States. We wanted to expand. 
So it means, expansion means the quality of growing or increasing So in the history of our country, we'll draw Florida down here, and then here's Maine out here, and there's Canada. So in the history of our country, we started out right here as 13 colonies, and we performed a massive expansion where we just took over everything that was to the West. That was a very awkward process, especially for Native Americans that had already been living here, minding their own business, and all their land was taken from them so that we could become, we could expand and become one huge country, right? And so sometimes this is called westward expansion, in history, that's it's a period known as westward expansion where we really started moving across quickly. Um, in the 1800s is when westward expansion really started to happen. I would say probably 1820s, 1830s onward and till finally California became part of the United States and Oregon as well and Washington as well. And some of the other states, Utah and Wyoming, filled in. Um, so expansion means to grow. And it's used in regards, in this story, it's being used in regards of expanding our country. Spread is the synonym. All right. I am doing the last four on this video. Your job is, I'm, is your job is, you're going to have two that are missing and you're going to have to look them up on your own. If you struggle and you have a difficult time looking them up on your own, you can look on this video. Okay. I will do all of them on the video. Swelled is our next word. And swelled is a verb. And it means to grow in bulk or size. So in our story, we're going to be hearing about a river. And the river is going to be swollen because of rain. So um, what's going to happen is that Charlotte is going to have to drive Charlotte, otherwise known as Charlie. Um, Charlotte changed her name to Charlie. She's going to have to cross a river with a super rickety bridge and the river is really swollen. The water has swelled to a really large height and the bridge just is kind of not super sturdy like it has little rails on it i'm just picturing it being kind of made out of wooden planks and then it has like some posts that go into the river and the river is swirling and swelling it's it's like stormy and the water's churning and so she has to cross this bridge um, with the swollen river And she's brave enough to do it. That's an E, by the way. All right, the next word is territory. And it kind of sounds like tierra. And when you see tear, that kind of relates to the earth or to the ground. In French, it's T-E-R-R-E, -R -R -E, terre. In Spanish, it's tierra, right? And so we also use it in English. Territory is a noun. And it is the land belonging to a state. And nation was the synonym that I came up with. So... 
for example, our state, we have our particular territory, which is based on where the Pacific Ocean is, right? And then we have a border right here that looks kind of like an elbow that comes out. And right along here is the Colorado River. And that's what takes the bite out of the bottom down here. And then down here is the border with Mexico, right? So this is our territory. Um, the territory that Charlotte or Charlie drove um, his stage on was our territory. It was from San Juan Batista to Santa Cruz. So he drove the stagecoach stagecoach line that went from San Juan Batista all the way to Santa Cruz. I'm guessing, and it was along the Pajaro River, right? So I'm guessing that it was probably a lot like Highway 129. It might have followed almost the same route as Highway 129. Highway 152, the, the hilly one that goes over to Gilroy, that was not, I think that was a later construction because it required a lot of effort to clear the road because it's so hilly and windy and twisty. Um, there might have been horse people that rode on horseback up 152, but I think that probably 129 was um, the route that Charlie drove the stage on, something similar following along 129. All right, our next word is churning. Churning is a verb. So um, agitate was our synonym, and it means to swirl or agitate. Um, so this is in the story, it's going to be talking about water, right? The water is going to be churning in the river. Um, sometimes we, if we have read Little House in the Big Woods, we know that to churn is technically a word that is used when making butter, right? In the old days, people would have a, uh, churn a butter churn and inside there's a thing called a dasher that's like a big huge paddle that moves around and it makes the butter form from the cream right so um, we're not really talking about butter in this case we're talking about river water but the river water is going to be moving around like the butter in a butter churn our last word is escorted. It's a verb. And it means to accompany another person. And there's an element of for protection. Um, so in the story, you're going to see that Charlie receives an eye injury. Charlie gets kicked in the head by a horse. Um, she's trying to, he or she, I always get confused with he or she. He is trying to tame a horse and um, is taming a horse. The horse kicks him in the head and kicks him in the eye and he loses vision in one eye. Um, if you can't see out of one eye, it causes you to have problems with your depth perception. So it's really difficult for you to see distance. My mom had lost vision in one eye. Um, several years ago, she just all of a sudden went blind in one eye for no reason. Her one eye just stopped working. And she had to stop driving her car because she couldn't see how far how distant things were. She would think that something was really close up when it was actually really far away. And if you close your eye, if you walk around the house and kind of experiment with
figuring out how far something is away from you with one eye closed, it's difficult. So Charlie gets injured, only has one eye that works, and so you're going to see that a friend escorts her when she's um, driving the stage because the friend is afraid that she's going to have an accident and that she's not going to be able to be a stagecoach driver anymore. So she's going to be accompanied by another person um, just to see how well she's still driving with, with her vision only in one eye. So I don't know if I dare draw a stagecoach. I definitely can't draw horses. But a stagecoach had really large wheels. And... The reason why it had large wheels is so that it could have springs. So it was... built kind of like it was built kind of like a box and what it did, what it had was there were doors on the box so and a window right and a door right here and then there was usually like another door right here and people would sit in here and then they would sit over here so it was kind of like um And then the driver would be up here. So the driver would be driving from up above. And then they would put all the luggage up on top of the stagecoach. And there was like a rack up here that would hold everything. And sometimes there was luggage that would go back here too. <laughs> and so stagecoaches were the way that people got around. If you had to go somewhere... Before trains were invented, before railroad tracks were built across the United States, a lot of people used stagecoaches to get around. And so um, sometimes money would be transported too, and mail. So there might be mail bags on here, and there might be money bags on here. And stagecoaches got robbed a lot because... If, if there were money in the letters or um, if there was money being carried like from bank to bank, bandits would come by and they would just, they would attack stagecoaches all the time. So you might be on the stagecoach riding, going to see um, another person or going to visit someone and you might get involved in a robbery because, we'll put a hat on this person because your stagecoach had money in it, right? So stagecoaches often got robbed. So if you were a stagecoach driver, you had to learn how to deal with that. Usually they carried a gun. Usually they, car they had a second person that rode along, otherwise known as shotgun, just like when you get in the car and you want to sit in the passenger seat and you yell, I claim shotgun, that's an old stagecoach term because usually if you went on a road on a path that got robbed a lot, they would hire somebody to ride with you that would be carrying a shotgun so that if someone was going to try to rob your stagecoach, you would think twice about doing that because you would have somebody carrying a shotgun that would shoot you. So um, in our story... Charlie's going to be escorted by a co-worker or a co-owner of the stage company um, after he loses vision in one eye. All right. I hope this helped you. I hope you enjoy reading about Charlie Parkhurst. Um, actually, Charlie is buried in the cemetery that's up by my house. That's right. She, he's buried right in the middle of the cemetery. There's a big, huge marker. I will post a picture of the marker so that you can see. And if you ever go to that cemetery, you can go and visit. It's pretty cool. All right. I hope this helped you, and I will talk to you later.